How are you? Today, you'll discover another exercise habit for longevity that is based on my 16 years of longevity research. There are 11 habits like this one, which you can access right now. It's free, plus other bonuses when you support my channel with $1. That's it. Now, enjoy the habit. Welcome to the Wellness Messiah podcast. I'm your host, Rimon. What is blood sugar? You have 5 liters of blood in your body. In that blood, you have many nutrients. One of them is sugar, or glucose. The body is using it to maintain a minimal function of various systems. The body has to maintain this minimal baseline levels. Otherwise, it cannot function. It will die. You will die. How much sugar do you think you have in your entire blood? Most people, most healthy people, undiabetic people, have about one teaspoon of sugar. That's it. This is, by the way, the result that you see in your blood tests. Now, this blood sugar is also called blood glucose. So, on the one side, we need this baseline level of blood sugar. On the other hand, we can increase blood sugar beyond this baseline. And this increase isn't good for your health or your longevity. So, now you understand the two levels of blood sugar. And the term that you need to remember is sugar spike or glucose spike. Glucose spike refers to the increase of sugar beyond the baseline, the secondary level of sugar. I hope this understood now. There are two main ways in which the body increases sugar in level beyond the baseline levels. The first major way is when we eat sugar and carbs. Carbs are trees of glucose, that exact sugar. And when you eat food with carbs and sugar, you're going to have an increase in this blood sugar beyond the baseline level. So, this level of sugar entering into the blood from the food that we are eating is going to add on top of the baseline sugar levels that we spoke before. The second way in which blood sugar goes up above this baseline levels is when the body, specifically the liver, manufacture it out of protein. Yes, the body can create sugar out of protein. It's a very simple process. It's called gluconeogenesis. Now, when does the body convert protein into sugar? The first time is when you eat protein. Every time you eat protein, some of it is going to end up with sugar. That's how the liver works. The second time the body manufactures glucose sugar is when you're stressed. When I take blood tests, whenever I'm stressed, I always see my blood sugars up about 20 to 30 percent, as if I ate sugar or protein. Yet, I ate nothing. This is one of the reasons why chronic stress is so bad for you. It's almost like eating sugar. And this increase of sugar, this sugar spike above the baseline level is associated with increased aging and shorter life. Let me show you studies on that by one of the most famous research organizations in our longevity community, the Intervention Testing Program, and also the interpretation of the studies by the head of the ITP, Dr. Richard Miller. In this study I'm about to show you, they gave mice caniglifizin, a diabetic drug. This drug doesn't prevent glucose sugar from being absorbed from the meal, but it does prevent this very rapid increase in blood sugar levels. Let's go into the study and see what they found. Caniglifizin extends lifespan in genetically heterogeneous male but not female mice. Cana, this drug, extending median survival of male mice by 14% with parallel effects seen at each of the three test sites. This means that this intervention testing program, they replicate the same study in three different locations. In every location, reducing those sugar spikes increased significantly the maximum lifespan. So, this drug in male mice leads to about 14% increase in lifespan. And Dr. Richard Miller, the head of the ITP, stated that, I'm quoting, this drug that prevents sugar spikes puts off at least five different kinds of diseases in mice. It's authentically an anti-aging drug. And it's the second of the anti-aging drugs in mice that works apparently by blocking the highest glucose levels during the day. Pay attention that he said that it's not a special characteristic to this specific drug. If you reduce the sugar spike, you're going to achieve the same result. And I say you don't need to take caliglifosin, you can do it by exercising or at least being active after meals. And this was going to flatten the highest blood sugar level of the day. Let's get practical here. How can we use exercise to reduce those blood sugar spikes and increase our longevity? 
There are two habits that we can extract out of this principle of lowering the highest blood sugar of the day. Let's hear now from Dr. Ron Rosedale, a founder of the Colorado Center for Metabolic Medicine and a world's expert on sugar and aging. In this interview, Dr. Rosedale spoke about his recommendation on the exact timing of using exercise for controlling blood sugar spikes. I'm quoting from him, the best morning after pill for mistakes in diet is exercise. If you're going to eat something that is going to raise your blood sugar, one of the major benefits of exercise is that it allows you to burn off that sugar and doesn't leave it around as long to do damage. The best time to exercise, if you splurge on something that you know you should not have, is immediately afterwards. Your blood sugar will rise immediately after you eat. Let's say that you ate potato, and that's going to cause your blood sugar to go up. You're better off to burn off that sugar that the potato is going to turn into than to leave that sugar around to glycate and raise your insulin and cause insulin resistance. Dr. Ron Rosedale referred to potato as a potential to become sugar because potato is simply a tree of many glucose molecules. And this is true to all high-carb foods, pasta, bread, cereal, anything really that comes from grains. Dr. Ron Rosedale did not mention sweets, but you already know that eating sweets and desserts will increase your blood sugar. It has sugar inside. Therefore, I call this habit exercise after sweets and carbs. Practicate means when you eat sugar, sweets, or high-carb meals, then try to move after, be physically active, and ideally not too long after the meal, after the dessert. A good timing is somewhere around 5 to 30 minutes after the meal. What I also like about this habit is that it stops binging. I used to be addicted to sugar and sweets and carbs, and when I started eating sugar, I simply could not stop eating it. But I noticed that as I implemented this habit, as I exercised for a few minutes, immediately the binging impulse stopped. So if you're like me, and you binge on sweets and find it difficult to stop, exercising after sweets, after eating sweets, stops the binging roller coaster. And honestly, the shame that comes with it. Notes about this habit. One, the activity doesn't have to be high intensity exercise. Any physical activity, any physical movement is good, but it needs to be soon after eating sweets and carbs. Two, the more intense the movement, the faster you'll burn blood sugar and bring it down. So if you add a lot of sugar and a lot of carbs, intense exercise is going to reduce the spike faster. Three, the amount of sugar that you ate matters too. If you ate a lot of sugar and carbs, then you want to exercise and move for a longer time because you need more activity to burn more sugar. And four, you can plan your pleasure meal and desserts immediately before exercising. Today, finally, I avoid sweets. But back in the day, I used to plan my pleasure foods right before exercise. Exercise I had to do anyway. And I also put sweets immediately before walks out of the house that I needed to do anyway. Practically, you can save the pleasure foods for times that you know you're going to exercise immediately after. So this is the beginner's habit out of this principle. If you're like me, eventually you will manage to control your sweets eating and carbs. You manage to overcome the cravings, then you're ready for the next level. Every meal will raise a bit your blood sugar. And for longevity, we want to reduce any unnecessarily increase in blood sugar. Here comes the more advanced habit. Eat to exercise. This strategy you can copy from Cristiano Ronaldo, really. And I believe this strategy is one of the reasons and is partially responsible for his career longevity. Let's hear his teammate explains how Cristiano Ronaldo lifestyle looks with eating and exercise. But you once went for lunch with him at Manchester United. I think you were going to have a gentle lunch and it turned out to be a very competitive afternoon. He said, let's go and having a lunch after training. Go to his house. I look at it. It was just some salad, plain white chicken, no juice, just water. So we have a food, quickly a lunch. And after that, he said, let's go in the garden and play two touch. I said, Cristiano, we just finished. So we go playing two touch. After that, let's go for a swim. 
after that, let's have a sauna, jacuzzi. I was like, Cristiano, why you di we didn't stay at the training room? <laughs> yeah. So that's why I said Cristiano deserves everything. Yeah. That's funny. This guy is known to eat meals to give him energy to exercise almost immediately after. So in essence, he actually eats to exercise. Now let's expand on the name of the strategy. Most people, including myself, use meals as a motivation to exercise. It's much more motivating to do intense exercise knowing that a nice meal is waiting for us after. And for most of my life, I did exactly that. Push myself to the limit with my workout, followed by rest and digest. I exercised to eat. However, those large meals create the highest blood sugar of the day. I measure that myself, and even when I eat protein, no carbs or sugar in the meal, some of that protein will become blood sugar. Our liver converts some protein into sugar, and we want to reduce that. Now, why is that important? Because we know that reducing those sugar spikes after meals increases longevity. Learn from Cristiano Ronaldo. Keep certain workouts, not necessarily all of them, after large meals. That includes also house chores. So we can use both high-intensity and low-intensity exercises after meals. So to summarize, eat to exercise instead of exercise to eat. This will squeeze more longevity benefits from your routine. What's the difference between this advanced habit to the previous habit? Well, in the previous habit, we assume that you will eat sweets and carbs from time to time. With this one, you can implement it after any meal with protein. Second, this strategy suggests a more intense exercise and truly intentional timing as part of our exercise routine. In other words, we plan some of our workouts to be exactly after meals by design. This habit, believe it or not, I managed to implement only in the last two years. So today, what I do, I plan certain workouts that are part of my exercise plan, exercise routine, immediately after the largest meals of the week. I've heard criticisms about bringing up this habit. Criticisms such as it's dangerous to exercise after meals. Because, you know, the gut and the muscles will compete for blood and nutrients. Well, I've been doing this habit for the last two years and I feel fine. And so is Cristiano Ronaldo. Some clarification though about this habit. This should be obvious. If besides protein you also ate carbs in the meal, this meal would be the best time, the best timing to add exercise immediately after. It would be better to do that over a non-carb meal. Another note that I don't feel the need to exercise after eating vegetables or oils, such as salad with olive oil. Instead, I keep my exercises and workouts for the largest meals of the day. Those that have a lot of protein. Because remember, the body is going to convert some of this protein into sugar. And it's going to increase our blood sugar. It's going to cause a blood sugar spike. The third note is that you don't need to do many exercises to achieve the purpose. Even one workout for 5 to 10 minutes will help a lot to flatten the sugar curve. Reduce self-judgment. I found that just being aware of the value of this habit helps a lot. What you'll discover that over time, simply knowing intellectually the value of this habit, you'll naturally be inclined to apply it. Remember, it took me 12 years to transition from beginners, meaning to burn sugar after sweets, into eat to exercise habit. Now, you don't have to do this with every meal, but it's really important after high carb meal or a large meal. And the last note is that you don't need to plan all of your workouts this way. Personally, I don't do it with every exercise. If the exercise is too intense and it requires a lot of concentration and focus, I much rather do it on empty stomach where I can concentrate. I like to use workouts as a meditation to reduce stress. And it works better for me if I do them on empty stomach. So it depends on the type of workout. As you can see, the habit's pretty flexible. The habit requires some experimentation and seeing how you feel. Maybe you are too tired to move after a meal. So don't be too tough on yourself and try to integrate it to your lifestyle based on your comfort level. And the most important thing to remember here is this. If Cristiano Ronaldo invites you to a lunch, don't go. Let's move on with the habits. And all the other habits I'm going to mention, they all refer to the intense exercise that is infrequent in our exercise routine. So let's move on. 